Hello. Hello. All right. It's 11.10. Let's get started. I'm going to start off today with announcements. So I forgot to write down my announcements. Get my phone. So the announcements that I announced during class are also posted online on our website. So if you forget what I say, um, you can just go to data8.org slash SU17 and get the announcements there. First, I want to say please attend the lab that you are enrolled in. This is because every lab is filled to capacity. So if you attend the lab that you're not enrolled in, um, chances are you're either going to steal someone else's seat or you're going to have to sit on the floor because there are no seats available for you. So please attend the lab that you are enrolled in. We have open enough seats in the class for everyone to be enrolled in the class. If you're not enrolled in the class right now, uh, please send me an email about it. I just checked in with the room coordinators today, and they said that they opened up, opened up enough seats for everyone to be enrolled. So woohoo, yay. Congratulations, you're now officially enrolled. Um, I believe that one of you may have gotten switched section because of some enrollment time, time thing to make the numbers work out. Um, do check to see which section you're officially enrolled in on Cal Central today, just to make sure like, you know where, where you're going. If you do not have an at berkeley.edu email address, um, I believe those are that would be the case for visitors from other universities or international students. Please fill out the form on Piazza so that we can give you guys access to Jupyter Hub, which is what you'll need to do homework one. So you'll want to you'll want to fill that out. Please fill that out by. I believe the announcement on the website says 9 p.m. today. But whatever the website says, please fill it out by that time so we can, we can process you guys. Homework 1 is released. So the link to the homework 1 is on data8.org slash SU17 um, in the calendar, in like the little table there. Um, go ahead and click on it to get started on it. And it is due on Friday at 11.59 p.m. Let's see. We have a welcome survey for those uh, for you guys to take. The, for you guys to take that welcome survey is worth one point on your next homework assignment, but it is due the day before your homework assignment is due because I want to kind of go over the results with you guys on Friday. So please fill it out by Thursday, eleven fifty nine p.m. in order to get credit for it. Cool. That's all the announcements I have. I want to start today by asking about you guys. So, how many of you guys have never programmed before? Cool. How many guys have never taken a stats class? Cool. Well, if you're one of the people that raised your hands or you're both, or you raised your hand twice, I have good news for you because this class is designed for you. Um, this class was designed as an introductory class for those of you who had no previous programming or stats experience. And so I want to point out that typically in data eight, I don't know if this is the case this semester, I, we'll find out with the welcome survey. But typically, typically for data eight, we have two groups of students. We have the group that has no experience at all with programming or stats of one of the two. And then we have the other group, which has lots of experience with both programming and stats, and they're just taking the class to see my face. Um, but I want to let you guys know that if you, if you don't have any experience, like this class was designed for you. And so during lab, you'll, you might see people who are just like racing through lab and like finishing everything, and people who like raise their hands in class and like blur out all kinds of stats, uh, lingo and terms that you have no idea what's going, and you have no idea, like you've never heard those terms before. Um, don't worry about it, because basically this class was designed for people with no experience, and I hope that you can just get into the mindset of trying to learn and try to do the best you can, okay? Um, Oh, how many of you guys, this is your first class at Berkeley. Any incoming freshmen? Okay, how many of you guys, how many of you guys, this is like the first, this is your summer after your freshman year. Any, any like people who just finished freshman year? Very nice. Any people from out of country? I think I have a couple of those. Very nice, nice to see you guys. Cool, so as I mentioned before, we have a big mix of people in this class. I hope you guys will all get to know each other in your labs. Let's go on to something more interesting. So today we're going to talk about causality. Specifically, causality refers to cause and effect. What, how one thing causes another thing. And I'm beginning with a little story about myself. So when I was a kid, I uh, my aunt was really into like health things, like healthy green smoothies, you know, that that kind of stuff. And 
And she came over to my house one day and she put a video on the screen for like my family to watch. And it was about it was kind of like this this angry lady yelling at people for like, oh, like this thing has like this preservative in it, and like, this thing doesn't have the vitamin E, and like she would list off like the 47 different kinds of heart disease, and, like the 57 different kinds of cancer you can get from like this thing. And so I watched this as like a very um, impressionable third grader, I believe I was at the time, and I, I walked away and I was like, wow, I need to get my life together. And so I went up to my mom and I was like, mom, I need to eat my greens, I need to eat, like, I can't have any candy, like, you have to give me only water every day. And mom kind of looked at me funny and she was like, what, like, what kind of, like, are you, how old are you really, you know? And, and so I did that for like a year and then I felt kind of miserable. And then I found out like a year later, people were like, oh no, you should eat like more fat or like, you should eat more carbs. And I was just like, okay, you know what? Like, I give up, I can't do this anymore. I just, I don't know what to do with my life. And it turns out that people often release health statements and they're like, and for example, in the past 20 years or so, there was people were really against fat, like saturated fat. So they'd be like, oh, if you eat saturated fat, you're gonna die. And then people were like, and then now, like a couple of years ago, they were like, well, actually, that's not that bad because if, if, you, eat, if you don't eat fat and you eat tons of carbs, you'll also die, you know? So, um, so, so people make these statements all the time. And it's hard to really decide which statements to believe and which statements not to believe. And in this case, um, NPR, which is like, uh, I believe, a British news, report organ news reporting organization, or American, I should know this. Sorry, I believe it's American. But um, they, published, they published an article saying that chocolate is good for your heart. Chocolate, chocolate is good for your heart, study finds. And in this class, we want to give you guys the ability to kind of take a statement like that and figure out, OK, is this a valid statement or not? How should I interpret this? What is, what, does this inform my decision making? Okay, so in any statement like this, chocolate is good for your heart, implicitly in that statement there are kind of three different, three different things that are happening there. The first is the individuals of this particular statement. So chocolate is good for your heart. In this particular case, did this, the study was done on European adults. Okay, so what is the, the people or the things or whatever, what is being affected by what is being affected in this particular statement? Then comes the treatment, or what you do to the subject of your study, your individuals. In this case, it's chocolate consumption. So European adults ate chocolate. And what happened? They got less, they, they found that they had less risk for heart disease, or they got heart disease less often. So any almost all cause and effect statements like that can be kind of broken down into the individuals, the treatment, and the outcome. Being very clear about those three things will really help us try to understand and break down and really piece, figure out what exactly a statement is saying about the world. So my first question, and the question you're probably asking if, you, if you've been paying attention is, is there any relation between chocolate consumption and heart disease? And by association here, association and any relation, those two terms I use interchangeably um, in this class, we'll probably use them at different times. So if you see association and you see any relation, just know that those two mean the same thing. So my, my question to you is, is there any relation between chocolate consumption and heart disease? And since this is a data science class, I'll give you guys some data. According to a study, among those in the top tier of chocolate consumption, 12% developed or died of cardiovascular disease during the study, compared to 17.4% of those who didn't eat chocolate. So please discuss with your neighbor whether you think that this shows an association between chocolate, eating chocolate and heart disease. Now, if you've already looked at the slides, because I had them posted like 12 hours ago, if you've already looked at the slides, don't spoil it for your neighbor. Um, but, so but just please try to discuss where you think this points to an association. Go. Yeah, 
All right. What did you guys think? Any volunteers? Can I get two volunteers? Share your opinion. Yes. Name and your opinion. Um, Alex, in my opinion, is yes, they are related because uh, so apparently chocolates that have high chocolate, uh, countries that have high chocolate consumption die less of cardiovascular disease. OK, so Alex says yes, um, because people who eat chocolate die of cardiovascular disease less. OK, great. Any other opinions? Yes. Um, Name and opinion. I guess like I think it's kind of hard to say. I think no, and the reason is because you don't know the sample size. You don't know how like much chocolate they're eating. Like if you eat one piece of chocolate every like month, it's probably going to be insignificant. So I'm not really sure how to evaluate the data. Got it. So your name is Chase. Yeah. So Chase says no because we don't know the sample size. We don't know how much chocolate they. Eat, we don't know a lot of things about the study. So how can we say there's an association? And well, we are getting way ahead of ourselves. Um, basically, basically, when we ask if there's any relation or any association at all, what we're what we're really looking for is is there a difference between the, does there appear to be a difference between the groups who ate chocolate and the groups who didn't eat chocolate? In this case, um, twelve percent died of disease who ate chocolate, seventeen point four died who didn't eat chocolate. So, in my opinion, this does point to an association because the numbers are different from each other. There's a difference between two groups of individuals. Now, that makes, it, that makes some of you guys kind of unhappy, so I'm going to say in my opinion. But, so, so that kind of leads to our next question, which is probably the more important one, which is, does chocolate consumption lead to a reduction in heart disease? Does, does eating chocolate actually cause you to get less heart disease? And well, that question um, is a question about, not association, but it's a question about causality. And it's pretty hard to answer in most cases. We're going to talk about some examples of that today, but just know that, just to be clear on the terminology that we're using in this class, association or any relation refers to just a difference in your individuals, in your, in your study participants. Causality refers to something more, more subtle. It refers to, does my treatment actually cause my outcome, or was there something else involved? In this case, this guy, the chief of preventative medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital Boston wrote, this study doesn't prove a cause and, reflect, cause and effect relationship between chocolate and reduced risk of heart disease and stroke. And well, I'm not gonna go into the example too much because I wanna go into a more interesting one. But in general, just, I, hope, I just hope that the difference between the two terms is clear to you. And that one, and causality is often subtle and more tricky to determine than association. I want, to use, I want to jump to my example for today, which is about cholera in the 1800s. So if you'll humor me for a moment and picture yourself in London in the 1800s with like the cobblestone roads, I actually don't know anything about London in the 1800s, but with like roads, like homes, you know, like horse, like cars were invented, so there were no cars. Um, vaccines were invented, so there were no vaccines. In fact, microscopes, they didn't, even, they didn't have microscopes, so they didn't know about like viruses or bacteria, so they didn't know about the things that cause disease. And at the time, cholera was kind of a big deal. So cholera is a disease of like your intestinal tract. Basically, you have lots of diarrhea and then you die. And it's kind of unpleasant. Um, and cholera will come in waves, okay? So, so if you're in London, you hear the news and you're like, oh, cholera, there's cholera in Germany. And you're like, oh no, it's coming. And then it's cholera in France. You're like, oh no. And then it comes to London and then, and then you die. And that's kind of unpleasant. And people didn't, and then it, and then it came and then you just, it just kind of went. No one really knew why, why cholera was there or how to get rid of it or any of that. And so people tried to figure it out. 
And the leading thought at the time was um, by these people called the miasmatists. I'll try to say that three times fast. They believed in miasmas, which are bad smells given off by waste and rotting matter. And they thought that these bad smells were the main source of disease. Now, if you think about it from their perspective, it kind of makes sense, right? You eat like bad smelling food and you get sick and you don't feel so great. You're around like poop all the time, like you might get sick more easily. You know, you're around, you know, like bad smells tend to be around people who are getting sick. So if you're in London and you don't have the microscopes and you don't know about bacteria, this is a pretty bad, this is a pretty like sensible conclusion to make. And so if you believe that bad smells are the cause of disease, well, naturally, your response in your response to a disease outbreak is to try to get rid of the bad smell. So, some suggested remedies are to fly to clean air, and um, to put flowers in a pocket. So, a pocket full of posies, so you can pluck the flowers and smell them if you're around bad smelling things or if you're sick to get rid of the to get rid of the bad smell. Now, this sounds familiar to you. this might sound familiar because it comes from a nursery rhyme, which is like if you're familiar, it's like ring around the roses, pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. Well, the pocket full of posies part refers to carrying around the flowers so you can ward off the bad smell. And the falling down part, well, that's, that's a permanent kind of falling down. So um, other people thought that, other people like the smell of gunpowder. I thought you could burn away the smell. So they would fire off your house of gunpowder. So, so all kinds of ways to get rid of the bad smell. And you look at this and you're like, wow, that's pretty silly. Like, why would anyone do this? But at the time, remember that it seems like a pretty reasonable conclusion to make given the knowledge that they had at the time. And so there are some pretty important people who believed, or who were very strongly believed in the theory of miasmatism, including Florence Nightingale, um, the founder of Modern Nursing, and Edwin Chadwick, the Commissioner of General Board of Health, who wants to go to the top of the Eiffel Tower and bring back like balls of air from the top of the Eiffel Tower to, to try to get rid of the bad smell. Now, um, there's a guy named Jon Snow and not the Jon Snow from the TV show, but Jon Snow, the original Jon Snow. And he didn't believe in the theory of miasmatism. And the reason why he didn't believe in the theory of miasmatism is because he looked around in his town, and he noticed people were getting cholera, and he looked at one house, and people were dying in this house, and he looked at the house next door, and everyone was totally fine. And he was like, well, like, this scene, maybe there's something more going on here than bad smell, because if both houses are next to each other, they probably smell a lot the same. And so he was like, well, maybe there's some other reasons that disease is being caused. And so he, he actually thought that water, like bad water, was a cause of cholera. Now, that was a pretty unpopular belief at the time. So he knew that he needed to find a lot of evidence to support his claim. So he actually went around in his little town. And he went door to door. He knocked on every door. And he was like, hey, has anyone died here? And, They'd be like, yeah, I'll ask people, and he'd be like, okay, just tell me how many. And then he went, so he went around the other door, and he got, and he put them on a map. And this is one of the very first data visualizations in history. So this map is a little bit hard to see for those in the back, but if you look on this map, so this right here, let me see if this laser works. Can you guys see that? No, not at all. I'm going use my mouse. So right here is kind of Jon Snow's map. And what you see here is that there are black bars. Okay, so here's a black bar, here's a black bar. Each of the black bars is located at a building. Okay, so it could be a pub, it could be a hotel, a house, an apartment, whatever. So he, so he took all the buildings and he went door to door and he asked how many people died. And what he did was the length of the bar here refers to how many people died in that particular building. Okay, so in this particular building, lots of people died. Um, this one right here, only a couple people. This one right here, like maybe like one or two people. Okay, so he went around and plotted, he plotted all of the people who died in his in his vicinity. And he also plotted the location of the Broad Street pump. So right here is Broad Street, which is where a lot of the deaths occurred. And it just so happened that there's a water pump located like right in the middle of that street, right there. And that was called the Broad Street pump. And so he looked at that map and he was like, well, it looks like a lot of the deaths are kind of around the Broad Street pump. But he knew that it wasn't enough because there are lots of deaths that happen like out here, out here. The deaths are like far away enough that there are pumps closer to them than the Broad Street pump. So he was like, okay, what's going on there? So it turns out that, so he actually went around again door to door and asked, hey, like, where do you get your water from? And what he found was that, for example, in this region right here, 
even though there's a water pump closer by, the alleyway that the alleyway they lived in made it so they had to go like around. They had, they had to make a roundabout path to get to the Broad Street pump. So they actually they had to sorry they had to take a roundabout path to get to their pump. So actually, like just just walking wise, it was faster for them to get to the Broad Street pump. So they got water from the Broad Street pump. He went to like this area here and said, "Well, there's like no one who died here. What's going on there? And no one who died here. What's going on there?" And so. Um, one of those places was a pub, and at a pub, why would you drink water when you can drink beer? So, and the water and the brew and the brewery had their own well, so they had their own well, own water source. So they weren't using the pub. Okay, so that's one of the places. The other place was a poorhouse or kind of a prison, a prison type of deal, and they had their own well as well. So no one died there. So he was like, okay, maybe there's something going on here. And there is like one lady who lived like all the way up here in the nearby district of Hampstead, I believe. And he was like, okay, like, why, why, why did she die? And it turns out that before she moved to Hampstead, she lived kind of closer to the middle, closer to Broad Street. And it turned out that she liked the, the taste of the water at Broad Street. So she would ask her, ask her family to bring her uh, water from the Broad Street pump. And well, now she's gone. There were some deaths that happened farther away, and he'd be like, "Well, what's going on there?" And it turns out, sadly enough, that there were there were children who would, like walked through the city on their way to school. And get water from the pump on the way to school, and they died. So, so now he has like, he's like, okay, I feel like there is something going on here. It seems likely that drinking water from the Broad Street pump is making people sick. Um, it was really unpopular. No one believed him. But and and if you if you think about what he did there, all he's doing here is showing an association, right? He hasn't shown that like he hasn't like given anyone water and making made them sick. All he's done is observe kind of like what happened to people in, in this area of London. Okay, so so he's on this sort of association, but he believes it pretty strongly and he goes up to like the city mayor and he's like, yo, like there'd be something wrong with your water. And the mayor's like, what do you mean? It smells fine. And he's like, well let me just take the pump, let me just take the handle off your pump. And the mayor's like, well okay, it couldn't it probably couldn't hurt. So took the handle off the pump and lo and behold, people stop dying of cholera. And so um, this is a pretty iconic story of kind of, well, one, it's, it's like a data science story, right? He used data to try to try to inform his, his decision. It also turns out that John Snow is considered today to be the father of epistemiology, which is a study of how diseases spread and the cause of disease. So um, these days, if you go to like the, if you go to the Center for Disease Prevention and Control in Atlanta, Georgia, um, You'll, you'll hear people saying, like, when there's a disease outbreak, they'll be like, where is the handle to this pump? Where is the handle to this pump? Because John Snow removed the handle off this pump. Now, if you fast forward a couple hundred years to modern day, what you'll see is that Broad Street has now been named to Broadwick Street, I believe. That's, this is the street. And instead of the water pump, now there's a pub named John Snow, an intimate pub named after a famous doctor. The British like to honor their people by, by drinking in their name. Yeah, question? So what's the whole deal with the handle then? So oh yes. Sorry, I should have explained. So the handle, so the if you take out the handle from the water pump, um, you can't get water from the pump anymore. Because they would like oh. use the handle to like get water out, but if there's no handle, like no water. So so people weren't able to drink water. Thanks, oh. thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Yep. So these days, um, there's a pub there, you can go and drink beer instead of water, potentially contaminated water. And if you take a look in front of the pub, John Snow, so there it is, you'll see this pump. And you'll notice that this pump is missing its handle. And so if you're ever in London, you can go check it out and say, hey, I know I know the story behind behind why this doesn't have its pump. Now, now in that case, um, so his theory was still kind of unpopular. People didn't really quite like believe his believe John Snow's like, grand idea that this disease could be caused by bad water instead of bad smells. So he tried to collect more evidence. Okay, so so he wanted so what he did was he took another map of the two major water companies that served water to London. Okay, so one of them was called South Work and Box Hall. One of them was, and the other one was called Lambeth. Okay, and more importantly, so they serve mostly different areas of London, but more importantly, there is one area in which um, both companies served. Both companies served houses there, and not only did they serve houses there, 
they serve them in kind of a round in kind of a random fashion. So house if you lived in a house there, um, you would just you would just probably choose a water company at your own discretion and you would get water from them. And so you could have all kinds of you could have like one house next to another house, one house would get water from South from SMV, the other house would get water from Lambeth. So you kind of get a mix of of houses that get water from these two companies. And that was very important for, for John Snow because um, well, I don't, want, I don't want to spoil it for you guys, so I'm going to explain later. But what he did was he took, he took this water map and he took the number of houses, the houses there that got water and the number of people that got cholera. And in this case, sorry, all my slides out of order. Oh, okay. So, sorry, I'm out of order, not my slides. So in this case, um, he has kind of, he has like, two groups of people, right? In the area where SNV and Lambeth serve the city, he has the group that gets water from SNV and the group that gets water from Lambeth. When this happens, whether by construction or just by a natural happenstance, we, have, we give names to these two groups. One group we call a treatment group. The, this group is a group that receives the treatment. So, in the example before with the chocolate and heart disease, the people that ate chocolate would be considered a treatment group. The other group is called a control group, and that group is a group that we designate to not receive the treatment. So in that case, they had they referred to some people who did not eat chocolate and got uh, heart disease. That group would be considered the control group. In this case, um, John Snow didn't really have a great way of distinguishing between like treatment and control because they're both both people, both types of people need to get water. So he probably just chose one of them or just to try to do a comparison on these two groups. The important part about the so the reason why it's important that the houses were not the houses were kind of randomly given a water company to get water from is because because, because the houses got water from different places. John was able to say that there is no difference, whatever, in the houses or the people receiving the supply of the two water companies, blah, 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 which basically means that there is no real like way to separate the two groups from each other. So he, so it wasn't the case that only rich people got SMV and only poor people got Lambeth. It was, it was kind of mixed together, and because of that, because of that, he was able to make the claim that whether you got SMV or Lambeth, that was not reflective of any other factors associated with, with yourself. So the two groups were similar except for the treatment. And this turns out to be really important when establishing causality. Because, for example, if, there were, if only, people, only rich people got SMV and only poor people got Lambeth and only poor people died, you wouldn't really be able to say whether the cause of cholera was the water or just being poor. Okay, so you need this, you need this similar except for a treatment in order to actually say that my treatment my treatment caused a particular outcome. So John Snow counted up the number of houses, counted, them, counted up the number of cholera deaths, and the deaths per 10,000 houses, and he made a table. Please discuss this table with your neighbor and, and discuss what you notice and what you might conclude using this data. So, 
All right, so talking has gone down in volume. Can I get two volunteers to share with us what you concluded from this table? Yes, name and opinion. Becca, uh, seems like there are a lot more cholera deaths from uh, houses supplied with S and B water than land beds. So. Okay, so Becca, Becca says that there are a lot more houses that died who got SNV than Lambeth or the rest of London. What does that What does that tell us, or what does that imply? Yeah, so it implies that it shows an association between like the, the water that is supplied by SNV and cholera. One more person. Yes, name and opinion. Uh, Alan, uh, our group saying that the uh, SV area has a higher death rate, so that may indicate um, the disease is related to the water supply there, or the water is contaminated. Yeah, as Alan? Alan, yes. Yeah, so Alan says it looks like there were a lot more deaths per 10,000 houses than there were in SNV than there were in Lambeth or the rest of London. Is that is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so Alan makes a good point, which is that he looked at this column, the deaths per 10,000 houses. And the reason why it makes sense to look at this column is because um, you want to look at the relative number of deaths. So for example, the rest of London has like 1,400 deaths, and SNV has a little bit less than that, 1,200, but the rest of London has many more houses, right? So you want to, so, so what really you want to compare is kind of the proportion, the relative number of of deaths per 10,000 houses. That would, that's what allows us to make um, a, a conclusion that seems more justified. Okay, so yes, so, so Josh now looked at this table and he was like, well, it looks like SMV has a problem. SMV, is, SMV has a lot more cholera than, than the rest of London. And so it turns out that SNV, South, South Wark, and Vauxhall, it turns out that their water supply was located downstream of like where the sewage of London came out. So that's where your water supply is located. Whereas Lambeth's water supply was located upstream of that, of that sewage drainage um, thing that was, that was kind of spewing out sewage into the water. And basically, he found that out. And now SNV, so after that, SNV like, kind of moved their water supply and, and all was well with the world. So the important thing to know here is that it was only because, so again, it was because John's treatment and control groups, in this case, the area of London that got both SNV and Lambeth water, it was because the two groups were similar apart from the treatment that he was able to say, okay, the, the fact that there's more cholera for people who get, from people who get water from SNV is actually because of water, is because of the water that SNV supplies and not because of some other factor that I'm not, that I'm not considering. If the two groups have differences apart from the treatment, then you then it's hard to make a claim like that. Those things are called uh, sorry. So so those differences are often present in observational studies because you don't get the opportunity to kind of like mix together the two groups. In the case of the chocolate and heart disease, um, it's possible that those who those who eat chocolate are more likely to do something else, or more, more likely to exercise to burn off the calories in the chocolate, so they got less risk of heart disease. For example, there, it was thought for a long time that coffee was linked to lung cancer, um, but people who looked into that more deeply actually found out that people who drank coffee were more likely to smoke. And so because of that, um, they looked into smoking and they're like, oh, okay, so we think smoking is an actual cause of lung cancer and not coffee. And so these things, so the fact is that affect your results but do not kind of are not specifically addressed in your study are called confounding factors because they confound you, they confuse you. In the case of the coffee smoking and, and lung and lung cancer, the confounding factor in the when they were looking at coffee and lung cancer. In that particular case, they so researchers did a whole lot of study on 
on smoking, lung cancer, different things that affect lung cancer. And it was only through kind of like the combined effort of like both like special treatment experiments and observational studies and science, like studying how like the chemicals in a cigarette affects the cells. It was only through a combination of all three of those that people were actually going, where people actually were able to say, okay, there's like really strong evidence that smoking causes lung cancer. We should just tell everyone to stop smoking. And because of that, the number of people who are smoking have, have gone down. But an important thing to note there is that data science and the things that we do in this class, it's as all, there's always an element of uncertainty to the things that we do, right? Even in the case of John Snow, looking at the water supplies and all of that, it is still possible that there is something else going on there that was not just the water. And fast forward a couple of decades later after John Snow, they discovered microscopes, they made good microscopes, and they were able to see, okay, cholera is actually caused by some bacteria, some pathogen that, that is dangerous. But it was data science that led to kind of like the study, the biology that kind of backed up, they kind of backed up each other and made people actually, that led people to understand the cause of disease and the cause of epidemics. So, so as always, um, I hope you remember that data science and statistics in a way has to deal with uncertainty. What we do is we try to, we try to like minimize uncertainty and use what we use the information that we have to make better decisions, to make more informed decisions. But oftentimes they won't be perfect. They won't be like airtight decisions, but oftentimes they'll lead you in the right direction. So I discussed before that it's really important to have two groups that, have, that don't have differences other than their treatment. I mentioned, I mentioned yesterday that we use randomization to kind of establish the reliability to infer results about a general bigger group of people. In this case, if we assign individuals to a treatment and control group at random, the intergroups are likely to be similar apart from the treatment. Now this seems, now this is a little bit unintuitive, but if you think about it, this, so if you think about our class, for example, in our class, I saw maybe about half the students who, who have no programming experience and half the students who did. So if I did a study on this class and I didn't randomize the two groups, so let's say I split the class into two groups. It's possible and actually pretty likely that one group will have more, more like, will have a different balance of people who study CS and people who didn't study CS than the other group. If I just cut, if I just cut the classroom in half like right here and just did left and right, Maybe everyone who studies CS likes to sit on the right side of class for whatever reason. So I, I could get everyone who has done CS before. So on the other hand, if I randomly give you guys a number and kind of say, okay, all the even numbers, like you guys are in one group, all the odd numbers, you guys are in another group, you can kind of see how I get a better mix. I get a better mix of people who have studied CS and people who haven't studied CS. And the reason why, I, and not only do I get a better mix, I can actually account mathematically for differences in two groups using, using the laws of probability. And that's why we teach probability in this class, and that's why you take more test classes, you will be doing more probability. <laughs> so we use the term randomized controlled experiment to describe an experiment where the two groups are randomly assigned, where individuals are randomly assigned to treatment and control. And that there is, and so that's the randomized part, and the control part is, is that there is a control. So, so two groups randomly assigned. A randomized controlled experiment is, for most people, a pretty convincing way to establish causality. Now, it's not always possible to do a randomized controlled experiment, even though we'd like to. Sometimes, so for example, if you're trying to discover the effect of drinking alcohol while you're pregnant, um, People who, if you tell people, if you tell mother to drink alcohol while they're pregnant, they probably won't listen to you. And so sometimes all we have, all we have to work with are observational studies. And in that case, we have to be very careful about the different factors that can go into the outcome of that study. But when we can, we like to use randomized control experiments to try to discover what things cause other things. I want to end with a note of caution. So. If you look up random in the dictionary, the first thing that pops up is haphazard. And in probability theory, random does not mean haphazard. So haphazard means kind of like, uh, like I'll just try to like do something to 
I'll, I'll just like pick people based on my own discretion and pick people into two groups. So random and haphazard are not the same thing. Random is actually a more careful, careful process. And as an example of perhaps a difference between the two, um, so at Berkeley, we do studies on mice. And for a long time, or for quite a while, our, when we did our studies, and when we did our studies, we had slightly different results from other universities that did studies on, that did similar studies on mice. And we were like, what is going on? What's special about the mice at UC Berkeley? Is it just because Berkeley is smart, so that our mice are smarter? And what they found out was that the average weight of the mice at Berkeley was higher than the weight of mice at other research groups or universities. And so they were like, hmm, it seems kind of suspicious. And they looked more deeply into it. And what they found was that the way that we got our mice was that when the researcher was picking a mice to give to us, he would like take the cage of mice and reach his hand inside the cage and just grab a mouse and then give it to us and put it in the cage for experiment. And well, it seems pretty, it seems innocent enough, but if you think about the types of mice that are in a cage, so if, if you just take a cage of, cage of mice, you have some mice that are faster and skinnier and some mice that are fatter and slower. Which mice are the ones that are more likely to be left behind as like the big, mysterious researcher hand reaches into the cage? It's going to be the ones that are fatter and slower. And so what we should have done was assign each mouse a number and then use, use a random number generator to pick a mouse for a research study. So random is not the same thing as haphazard, and you have to be careful when discussing randomness because random is actually a pretty precise term. So that's all I have for today. Um, I wanted to, I hope that that was interesting to you guys, and I hope that that motivates the study of data science. We're going to be doing, we're going to be doing the nitty gritty Python stuff in lecture for the next couple of weeks, so this, I hope this kind of sets the tone. By the end of this semester, you guys will have all the tools and skill necessary to perform the same type of study that John Snow did on, on London and all of that stuff. So I hope you guys are looking forward to that. Thanks. I'll see you guys tomorrow.